What's up, everybody? This is Carrick with ACG, and as always, it's my continuing mission to bring you reviews that aren't two minutes long or filled with sponsored bullcrap. And today, we're taking a look at Battletech from Harebrained Schemes. This is a title where you live out the life of mercenaries in turn-based battles, and how does Battletech do that differently than others? Well, I think it's the only option that really makes sense. You smash questionably safeguarded fusion engines into giant versions of those crazy dancing DARPA robots that are on YouTube, you rivet bold ordnance all over the bodies, and see who can turn the other into requisite atoms the fastest. All, of course, while trying to not catch yourself on fire by using too many weapons at once and building up your heat rating. It's a little bit XCOM, a little bit boyhood fantasy to be a firefighter, and of course, GoBots versus Transformers all wrapped up in one. Let's see how it does, shall we? And as always, if you like the video, eh, maybe subscribe. So here's my review for Battletech by Harebrained Schemes. Mechless heatsink advances in adjusting two-hit chances. Graphics are up first. Now it's something to remember. The Battletech franchise, all the way back from when the original tabletop game was created, is about mimicking giant robots going into battle. But it is less Pacific Rim and more robot jocks. Look that last one up if you're a B-movie fan. You'll thank me. That means that the weight and crunch, and for the majority of Battletech, just the feel of inertia that goes on here is noticeable. Some of the weapon effects, like the first time you fire off a full long-range missile cluster and it looks like you're facing an exploding pomegranate and no one bothered with putting any kind of flight dynamics on the missiles. They fling around and mostly hit the target, or at least near it. The PPC hits with a massive explosive impact, and even the lasers, though they lack impact, they burn off and melt bits of the metal that plays into the game's atmosphere and fiction incredibly well. Also, while not all the mechs of the time period are here, most are, and for the most part, bar a couple missing up-close weapons, you might say, they look well detailed, with that very typical built-by-kids-out-of-spare-carnival-rides pieces that Battletech has always been known for. Now, moving on to locations, most of them are excellent, if a bit barren, like there's a moon level you visit many times in the campaign as you travel around or in skirmish and multiplayer modes. It allows for the interplay of the lighting effects, which can be excellent here against the black background of space. But sadly, it's not all good. Some of the locations do look, as I said, barren and really have a feeling of being a bit gamified more than I would like, and certainly more than I would like in a game that does have a lot of little RPG elements that you end up experiencing throughout it. Also, if a game camera could be defined as a bright spot in the universe, this game camera might be the planet it's farthest from. It sways, it doesn't move correctly, and it never really adjusts to the sliders that are in the options. Now, is it impossible to use? No, because you can turn off various settings and just sort of pre-camera it, but the game really does want you to feel like you're seeing these mechs in an action movie style, but that's never really played off perfectly because the camera just really can't get its shit together most of the time. While damage is exciting with fiery bits and pieces exploding off the mechs at pretty much every turn and the heavy-handed way they move as they sprint down valley floors or through shallow creeks, it's the performance that seemed to be a little bit all over the place here. For example, I had issues where when I started the performance was fine, 60 FPS at 1440p with all the settings cranked to the max on a current i7 and a 1080 with just a couple judders here or there on loading, no big deal. But as the game progressed, even with fewer mechs in some battles, the engine started to chug a bit, and when in multiplayer and skirmish, this doesn't happen very much at all, which does seem to indicate something going on, maybe a tiny memory leak within the campaign itself. Overall, here's the thing, though. The design of Battletech was already well-established prior to the birth of many folks listening to this video, and it does really well, from the rough-and-tumble feel to the battle mechs, to the excellent character design of those on your ship, or who you hire to join you in your robot jocks rolling battles. Also, snap kick and robots? That is always going to be pretty ace. But the performance does take some hits, and the weapons, especially many of the beam weapons, can look a little bit funky when being used in particular territories. As a package, I'd say it is good, but it does have a couple caveats. Luckily, even though the UI looks incredibly busy at first, over time and over a little bit of understanding, you realize that most of it makes sense. It could be a little bit smaller. You can turn off one or two of the options. But overall, I'd have to say I really did like the look of this title. Sound? music, and voice. Okay. On my way. And 
and let's do sound first. This I actually loved when a flurry of missiles slam into a mech and then another flurry and then another one all launched from what's the equivalent of a missile launcher with legs. The sound can be insane. Metal shears off, beam weapons roar, and it's all spread across the sound ranges. Nothing gets overly crowded in any particular area. I do have to say that in some ways they did go for a slightly more realistic and crowded series of sound samples for some of the weapons, which can skew a bit on the terror of standing next to a real missile battery. If you don't know what that sounds like, go on YouTube and you can find some samples there. The slightly more fictional and many times softer steam releasing sound that we hear in other games isn't really quite replicated here. So that first time you fire off a volley, it can be an audio treat or a bit on the overwhelming side, depending on you. There is one pretty huge caveat here though. There's almost no environmental sounds and that does hurt the title. There's a bit of rain and wind on the requisite levels, but it really would have gone a long way for me to connect the battle mechs and the environment they were in if there were more environmental sounds, especially because it's not a first person game and they're not pretending you're inside the mech with all the assorted sound dampening that would occur. Overall, I really did like it, but there was a couple issues here and there. Music. So with the lack of a great deal of environmental sound, this is a place where the music could filter up and fill a bit of the audio gap. And if it's good, elevate the execution of the title, despite the fact of the missing sounds. And of course, if it's bad, noticeably hamper it. Luckily, the music is excellent. There's a mix of driving synths and electronic percussion that has no problem fading through into huge orchestrated movie style pieces from time to time. It is over the top a bit, and it is largely theatrical. What I mean by that is in some ways it does mimic what you would expect in a big time action movie, but when it comes to what's going on in this game, it certainly seems fitting. Voice. This was surprisingly lackluster. While the opening credits and the voiceovers for a couple main characters are applied fittingly for a great deal of the game, there's simply no voice lending to this strangely silent affair in a game where there's not only a ton of reading, but an incredibly dramatic story playing out, even if it's just in the presentation of the lore or in the betrayal of someone you trusted. I would have loved for more voice, and while most likely this is a budgetary issue, it does remain an issue regardless, especially in the campaign, which is, as I said, quite story deep. What's here is good, but the lack of full voices does hurt its presentation a bit, especially with so much reading. Gameplay and a bit about the story. In Battletech, you take on the mantle of a lance leader and the owner of a mercenary unit just around the end of Battletech's version of the Dark Ages, which for long-term fans means that some mech units won't be in the game you might want to actually see. For those who are just jumping into Battletech, there's various websites if you want to check it out, but most likely you won't need it because the game does a pretty good job sifting through all of the story and what's occurring with its opening cinematics and fully staffed spaceship with people in every major location who will tell you what's what, give you advice for gameplay and text tutorials, and explain in greater detail what's needed to run Carrick Snord's Irregulars. Now, most of the gameplay is either aboard your dropship, taking actions and traveling to destinations, and then, of course, landing on those destinations and trying to murder anyone nearby. And the game certainly doesn't hold back. It almost has you instantly jumping in there, running your company through a series of campaign stories, as well as side missions you can pick as you travel the Battletech universe. Each mission has a difficulty rating, indicating potential threats, but almost more importantly, it has a biome environment meter, which will tell you where you're going and how that biome will affect your mechs. Like, is it a desert or is it an ice location or a vacuum? This is one of the places that the game starts to feel a bit like the mercenary simulator we were all hoping for. When you originally go into battle, you can choose to take more money or more salvage from the field. Because, of course, those on the planet probably also want to take the salvage. And the less you take, the more influence you can get with that part of the star system, which can result in weapons from that star systems and manufacturers being offered in the mech markets quickly. After merging mech with man by deciding who's piloting what battle tech, you leap onto the planet and try to figure out if you can bake a continent-sized pizza while standing on it. Battles can take various different forms, but many of them are things like holding off enemies as political refugees escape, saving dropships that have crash-landed on planets, or attacking enemy mech lances and hiding out in the nearby woods. Players move in an initiative-based, almost XCOM-like style. Now, each battle mech is controlled by a pilot, and each pilot has various stats like piloting guts and gunnery, with bonuses on small stat trees that add to damage, speed, heat sink efficiency, and so on. But also, those basic bonuses are interspersed with two major skills per tree that may add the ability to, say, attack and then move, which I'm going to tell you later on is going to be vital. Most of these skills can also only be used once you've built up enough morale during the battle, which I'll talk about in a second as well. Battletech's reliance on a smaller number of more impactful stats really does pay off here. Luckily, as the main game itself, it also isn't separated by just light and heavy mechs. It goes light, medium, heavy, assault, and having that fourth type 
does do some wonders for the flexibility of the gameplay, especially when combined with a movement system that at first can be a bit restrictive, but really does play into the strengths of the title. For example, as I said, you have to have a specific piloting skill or you can't attack, then move out of turn. You have to move and then fire, which means the game can feel a bit outdated. It's not, and the combination of various factors plays heavily into that movement strategy. But some folks who are gonna play it are gonna think, okay, so I can sprint around, I can stop on a dime and I can fire, but I can't already be unmoving, fire, and then run for my life. Much of this is due to the way the game's evasion point system works and how important it is. Movement can be walking, sprinting, or just using jump jets. Now, when walking, you can fire your guns once you've stopped. When jump jetting, you can also fire when you've stopped. But when sprinting, you build up evasion points, which help your defense, but you can't fire at the end. So when an enemy tries to hit you, their chances are modified not only by the weapon's various stats, but also any terrain modifiers you may have, like being in a forest where it's harder to hit you, plus that evasion rating you may have built up if you sprinted. And those bonuses can be stacked. Now, this can be the difference between ending up a fiery, slaggy heap or coming out on top. Because moving fast like a freak into some nearby forested area and then lighten up the enemy and hoping the combination of your movement plus the cover stops them from hitting you back really is the name of the game here. This is where, for a lot of gamers, it's going to be knowing what kind of enemy you face that's so important, as well as their potential weapons. It's not new. In fact, it's ancient when it comes to gameplay. But where Battletech does it right is mixing all the skills, the weapon, the damage types, which I'll talk about in a second, plus the movement system, and then ratches that up with a shit ton of mechs. But just like naturally born triplets, some mechs are faster and some are slower. From the Fabergé egg fragileness of the Nimble Locust to the downright scary, almost primordial power of the King Crab, each battle mech can be outfitted according to their specific designs, hard points, and allowed tonnage. When it comes to weapons, you have energy, ballistic, missile, and physical attacks, each doing different damages to the structure of a mech itself, the armor, or even perhaps its ability to stay standing. What is nice here is the ever so slightly elevated feel of the fiction's weapons having somewhat realistic effects on the mechs. It's not like no games have done this, but there's something telling about a flamer jetting out liquid sun onto an enemy mech to drive their heat up so they can't fire at you all the while you're dancing around peppering them with shots. Or the fact that machine guns don't do much damage at all unless the armor of the mech's been blown off, like celebrated in a shotgun wedding, but instead of throwing confetti, you're tossing around 7.62 rounds. It's almost magical when you discover weakness on a mech and exploit it, like the weak rear armor on a heavy mech, allowing your smaller mechs faster on their feet to zip around peppering them, or smoking out a heavy mech by constantly engaging it with the combined flamers, and suddenly they can't fire at you. After you win or lose a battle, you eject from the battle mech, or you're just plain screwed up, you end up getting experience points and salvage for the mission. Now, this can be in the form of mech chassis with a certain number needed to build up a new mech, and you can also get some weapons and equipment. And this is another place where the depth starts to build. There are generic versions of all weapons, but there are also various manufacturers, sort of like Borderlands games, many with various traits like longer range, more damage, less heat, and so forth. And this is where the nitty grittiness of the game sort of applies with your piloting skills, your various different versions of the mechs, how you built them, how you've armored them, all mixed with the different weapon types, especially as you go further in the game, there is an insane amount of flexibility. It really does switch things up and how you do matters because the game, as I said, uses a morale system for the special moves during combat, which if you build that morale, it allows you to pull off those moves that the pilots have bought. Now, all this wouldn't be Battletech if we didn't talk about heat, because in Battletech, it's like a Phoenix summer. It's all about heat management. You can see almost everything in the game world that generates heat in the mechs, and the heat sinks that you have installed will try to wick that away. If you don't do it fast enough, it can damage the mech or even shut it down or make it so that your neck shots will do that as well. Now, as I mentioned before, environments can help with this. If you dive into a creek, your heat wicks away far faster than if you were, say, in a desert location. And of course, that means that there are a number of strategies that can play out. Do you take the high ground so you can see more, but with heat buildup higher than maybe others? Or do you hide out in the creek waiting for a lucky pot shot? And I just love that connection of all those different elements put together. It's why I like the original game, and it's why it's really translated very well here. Now, once you jump back aboard your ship, you have a number of things you can do. You can upgrade it with various modules that improve your ability to repair mechs, allow you to raise the morale of the team, and so forth. You also handle the team's finances here, which is a balance of paying well to keep morale high so you have almost instant use of those piloting skills when you're on the field versus going bankrupt because much of the game is traveling for days interspersed with death like a Roman legion. For example, you may need to travel 15 days to a planet, each day getting closer to the day that you have to pay your employees as well. But there are ways to mitigate this a bit. 
You can store mechs versus keeping them ready instantly for battle. This means tearing off their weapons and packaging them up. You don't pay a maintenance fee on them, but of course, trying to get them out of storage takes time. And that's the duality of the storyline here in the stress of time versus money. Do you store some mechs and save some cash and then get to your mission location and try to unstore them? Do you wait till payday and then tell everyone Christmas is canceled and then pay them 20% less so you can keep your entire mercenary unit afloat? And of course, trust me, there will be some lean months here because if you do go bankrupt, it actually means total game over and you have to reload one of your save games. And if you're on your way down a long debt sheet, it can be hard to find the right save that doesn't lose you a bunch of hours of game time, but doesn't also allow you to be not too far into the red already on your slide to destruction. Also, a bit about the story here. The main game sort of opens up and allows for more and more travel to various planets to look for work, while consistently not open world. I don't want people to think it's that. The feeling of flexibility here is appreciated as I dropped into faraway planets and hoffed my way through a number of generators to raise some cash for my team. The fact that the main story didn't take place all over the map also is a boon, as that let the other locations be introduced via the side missions. Onboard is also where the developers built out the fiction of the mercenary team, with small events that occur around the ship from time to time that you have to make decisions about. Everything from deciding to kill a betrayer to stopping two mercs from fighting over a wall one wants to knock down. Most decisions give you a small penalty or perk to skills or money for a time. Also, on the ship you can outfit the mechs, repair them, hire new pilots, and take on various smaller activities even if it's just talking to some of those who run the main sections of the vessel. When it comes to multiplayer and skirmish, you can set up your own game with or without being private, as well as a local game against the CPU. You can pick from an assortment of options, like how much tonnage can be used in the battle, identify which of the 12 maps you want to jump into, and then leap into the fray. You can even identify if generic mechs need to be used versus some player-made Frankenstein creation as well. Now let's talk about difficulty, because it's pretty important here. The game is a breeze in the first couple missions. Like, there were times where I was diving into the options to find some kind of difficulty setting. At the start, it was me versus an equal number of mechs, somewhat armed the same. But if you leap into the higher difficulty missions, and as I said before, you can see how difficult they might be prior to taking them, expect to be the rough participant of a prison welcome, because damn. And of course, that brings us to fun factor. There are a few things less enjoyable than taking out an enemy lance and suddenly two sets of reinforcements tear us out of the woods like you're a monkey carrying the last banana. Crazy fun. Battletech has always been one of my favorite old school games, and Harebrained Schemes is, of course, owned and operated by the original creator of the game itself. And that older heritage leaks through a bit in the interplay of the pilots and the arms manufacturer changes, the specialness of the movement and the evasion system and so forth. There's a crunchiness here that's glorious. But unfortunately, when the gameplay is impacted by performance or polish, that has to be brought up. And for me, with the crashes and the poor performance at times graphically, I really do have to say that that impacted my fun factor a great deal because I was always trying to figure out what was going on, what little bug I was experiencing. And it's not that there were bugs during the gameplay. It's the fact that as a product, it wasn't necessarily super stable. And of course, with those performance issues, they really did hit it in the wrong places. So as you guys know, I rate games on a buy, wait for sale, rent, or never touch it again rating scale with rent replaced by deep, deep sale on PC. This is actually a wait for a sale because of those issues I mentioned during the fun factor and during the graphics sections. There's some issues with performance, some issues with just general overall stability of the product, and that really does hurt the title, especially because it's about 10 bucks more than I think a lot of us expect for a budget title. It's a little bit higher than the $29.99 we've seen a lot of titles enter into these various different genres at, and it really is noticeable when you start seeing those performance drops, especially on the higher powered PCs. So anyway, that's it for me. I hope you guys liked the video. If you did, give it a thumbs up. If you didn't, give it a thumbs down. Maybe check out Reddit or my Twitter. And of course, you can become a patron on my Patreon webpage, which allows for you to help the channel continue to give you reviews that aren't two minutes long or filled with sponsored bullcrap. And as always, I buy every single game I review, even if I get a free code from the developer. Peace out and enjoy the rest of your week.